Hello and welcome to the Moving Past You Radio Show. I'm your host, Juanita Gaynor, and I want to welcome you to this evening's show. This week, we are in the third week of our four-week series, Character Under Construction. And tonight's topic, we are going to talk about the company we keep. But before we do that, let us go before the Lord in prayer to ask us to direct us and to guide us as we think about the company we keep. Dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace and mercy, leaving our burdens at the foot of the cross. Father, today we request your Holy Spirit draw near as you give us discernment in all that we do. Open our eye, open the eyes of our hearts, O oh Lord, so that we will be able to identify the plans of the enemy. Guide us to make the right decisions in our lives as we follow through with your will. Raise us up, Lord, so that we would not fall by the wayside. Take full, complete control of every aspect of our lives. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. So, I definitely want to thank you guys for joining us for this lovely journey of character under construction. Tonight's scripture is going to be coming from Proverbs, the first chapter, and we are going to focus on specific, you know, scripture, um, scriptures throughout that particular chapter, and we will get um, delve into the Bible um, verses um, in a minute. Um, but we're just going to do just a couple of, you know, just some recaps for the past couple of weeks. The first week was controlling our thoughts. And the takeaways from week one was understanding that the pathway to controlling our thoughts begins with an understanding of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We also learned that there are challenges to controlling our thoughts. We also learned that unseen thoughts produce visible consequences, meaning whatever you don't say, even though if you think it, it's going to manifest at some point in time. It never fails to do so. Also, we're to focus on what is true rather than what is not. We must tell ourselves the truth and we need to focus on the positive rather than the negative. And on last week, we dug into guarding our hearts and the takeaways that we had from last week's lesson was one to protect everything that comes in. Don't just let anything protect everything that comes into your heart. Persevere in the face of difficulties. Follow what the Lord is leading you to do. Cultivate an atmosphere of community. You are to keep your priorities high and do not compromise. That is a very important one. Do not compromise. Trust the Lord with your rest and finally, preach the gospel to yourself each day. And that's important because you have to continually build yourself up. You have to be prepared for what is to come in this particular battle. Because as a believer, as a Christian, it is inevitable. We are going to have to go into battle. So therefore, if we're preaching to ourselves and we're having relationship with Christ and we're filling ourselves up, we are doing what we need to do to guide our heart. That's exactly right. We're going to do that. But let's um, just jump a little bit in Proverbs, the first chapter. Um, let us go to, we're going to start at verse 8, and we're going to do 8 to 19 about so. And we're going to read from the King James Version, and it reads as such, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, Consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay 
wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole and who and those that go down the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with the spoils. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay in wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Um, and I'm going to read Proverbs 133. It says, But whosoever hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet fear from evil. So, when we think about character, you know, where do we go to develop character in our lives? You know, in a world that is obsessed with outward appearance, we need to remember that God is in the process of developing character in our lives. And he wants us to be a part of that process. When we choose to renew our minds, it will result in transformed lives. Character is more important than personal achievement or fulfillment. So have you ever been the subject of peer pressure? You know, what did you do to go along with the crowd or to keep up with the Joneses? Keep up with the Joneses is a phrase that I also like to say a lot of the times. But, you know, in those thought process, I want you to think about this evening. Um, what did I do? to go along with the crowd or to keep up with the Joneses? Was it that I didn't speak out when I saw something wrong? Was it that I tried to spend above and beyond what I normally would have spent because I was trying to make sure that I had the appearance that I had everything together? It's something, a phrase that my grandmother used to say all the time to me, and she would say, birds of a feather flock together. You know, it is something that I can remember. I'll, I'm in my 40s. So I know many of us can re remember and relate to that. It's not something in the Bible, but it tends to have a little bit of truth sometimes. Not always, but you know, my favorite one has always been guilty by association. And when someone said it to me, I was like, but I didn't do anything wrong. However, the people I chose to associate myself with did wrong. So therefore, because they were my friends and I associated with them, it was automatically assumed that I did exactly what they did. You know, many, many people, many executives, you know, CEOs, business entrepreneurs, they say this phrase all the time. And it says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And we can say that in the body of Christ, show us your friends and we can show you the path to your future. See, the company we keep steers us either in the right direction or in the wrong direction. You know, there is much benefit to be found in good company and you can be hurt. You can find hurt and mischief in bad company, you know. So if those is, if that's the case, then it's best for every good person to be, keep good company. Now, you know, in good company, there's a much benefit. And of course, in bad company, it can be trouble. So, you know, when you think about bad company, you know, <laughs> it's so much mischief to be had, you know, and good company. Well, good company, this is what I've learned with the friends that I have. Let's just break this down in an everyday, normal day-to-day -day pattern. When you have good people around you, solid people around you, people with integrity, people who have character, people who can hold you accountable, 
you are not likely to just to go left because you can go left or try to slither or try to make do or try to do less than because you have people that are around you that has some substance that is going to hold you accountable and not let you get away with that type of stuff. See, those are the types of people that you want around you. Now, our not so nice friends what they will do is they will they can just snuff out your fire you know because they don't want you to grow because then if you grow and leave them or not be around them then they they don't have anybody else to play with you know see what is the reason that, you know, many of us ha- has been really, you know, nonchalant about doing what's good. The reason why a lot of the times is because we are straddling the fence and we have co-mingled pe- with people who do- does not have our best intentions at heart, who doesn't have anyone's best intentions at heart, and they're only looking after themselves. So therefore, we kind of cooled off and we're sitting on the fence and we, we're going either way. We're going we're, you're like a little bobblehead. See, dishonest, evil, bad company will quench and cool your affections to what is good. You know, it will infect you with evil. You know, you see how it is with diseases, you know, that once they get started, once they take a ground hole, sometimes they just spread like it's uncontrollable. That is what how bad company can do. Remember, my grandmothers used to say one bad apple spoils the bunch. And I used to wonder how was that? How did that happen? So I had went to the farmer's market last week and um, I had just been coming off of had been not feeling well. I had really bad migraines for a couple of weeks now. And so I just was coming um, off of that, went to the doctor, got my shot, you know, just kind of, you know, getting back into the motion of things. And I bought a bunch of fruit and what I did was I put it in a bowl and I kept going about my business. Well, what I didn't know that one of them was really, they was probably almost just about spoiled. So I, with work and whatever, I didn't even think to maybe put some aside, maybe cut it up. I've just been going, 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 going. So today when I went, um, no, last evening, um, when I went to grab a piece of fruit out, all of it was spoiled. And I'm like, I know I didn't purchase all spoiled, you know, fruit. I knew I took my time and I, you know, picked through it or whatever. But it looks like the one that was in the center was already bad. And because I never removed it, It therefore seeped out and leaked out and infected all the other ones around it. So therefore it became bad as well. And so what it is to say is like when they say one bad apple spoils the bunch. Yes, it does. Because if it's not checked, if you're not looking at it, if you're not paying attention to it, it will affect everything that you got going on. So let's think about, let's deep dive into this. Let's talk about, you know, the company we keep. So we want to really talk about the danger of keeping bad company. See, one of the most overlooked and ignore warnings in all of the scriptures that I found is in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Here the Lord tells us to not be deceived. You know, and it says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. First Corinthians, I apologize. First Corinthians 15 and 33. Y'all have been going over to like Corinthians, like which Corinthians first or second. But see, (laughs) what the thing is, it's like, what does evil company and good habits mean? And what do they have to do with the Proverbs? 
which is an awesome question. So let's go ahead and dive further. You know, 1 Corinthians 15.33, it says, Do not be deceived or led astray to wander, to roam aimlessly, to be led away from the truth and into error and sin to mislead and seduce evil or bad, worthless, wicked, vicious, malicious, cowardly, destructive company or companionship, communion, conversation, speech, talks, corrupts. Now, as I'm saying the certain ones, I was going into the the examples of what each word is. So evil, when we talk about evil, I'm just doing some backtracking. Evil can is in the same breakdown for evil is bad, worthless, wicked, vicious, malicious, cowardly, destructive. When we talk about company, it may not just be physical. It's your companionship. It's who you commune with. It's who you conversate with. It's who you talk to. Corrupts. Corrupts means destroys, spoils, wastes away, to utterly decay, to, to corrupt fully, to deprave. Good, moral, useful, pleasing, virtuous, habits, Morals, characters, or one manners of life. You know, you cannot be deceived by those. See, the Lord is warning us not to be easily deceived and to thinking his words and admonitions are meant for someone else and not for us. You know, we sometimes think maybe he meant them for someone not quite as spiritual as we are or not quite as mature or not quite as smart. Maybe someone's weaker. They may be more naive. You know, they can't be trusted to do the right thing at the right time like I can. Do you really believe that? His word is for all of us. There is no hierarchy of what his word is for. This isn't a choice to say we are going to just go ahead and do this because it feels great. And this is what we want to do. And this is how we want to operate. No way. See, it's this kind of thinking that gets us into trouble every time. See, the first warning in 1 Corinthians 15.33 is about deception. We are not to be deceived into thinking what God is telling us is either not true or doesn't apply to our situation. And that's how the enemy gets us. Because he'll slither in and was like, that, you know, that's not really true about you. You know that that doesn't apply to what you're going through right now. So yeah, he may he may be talking about that, but that's he's not talking about you. You know, we we shouldn't we can't be deceived into thinking that that warning is meant for someone else, because obviously we are doing something. We have moved in such a way that he has had to issue that warning. So therefore. Every time God speaks to you, every time he shows you something, every time he moves, it is for you and your situation and for what you're going through and how you're moving and where your purpose to be. So never think that he's telling us something just to just say it or just to speak it or just for us to read it or just for us to experience it. There is always a purpose in it because it is the ultimate goal for the kingdom of God to be built, you know, because see, the reason why we shouldn't be deceived again into believing that it was meant for someone else is because, you know, that is the rationalization that we make regarding his word. Whenever God's word doesn't allow us to do what we want to do. Now, I used to be the queen of that. You know, have you ever heard of, you know, the different, you know, how somebody will just take a scripture and they will just quote that part of the scripture and they won't quote everything else before it. And they only quote that part because it makes it seems like, 
you know, they can do whatever they want to do. Did she ever think about that? That is the funniest one of them all. So let us just look at some of the verses that we commonly misquote and misuse to fit kind of our perspective that kind of works into this aspect of why we therefore disregard to do things, especially to make it for our benefit. Um, one of those scriptures is first Corinthians 10, 13. And what people say often is God won't give you more than you can bear. And what it actually says is no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. See, the passage talks about temptation, not about trials or difficulties. See, God never promises, you know, that we'll be able to handle everything that we face in life. In fact, there will be situations that are beyond us. And those are the prime occasions to turn to God in total surrender. The next one is Romans 8.28. And I love this is one of my favorite (coughs) verses. But it is often misquoted a lot of the times. What you hear people say is and what they think is God works out everything for our good. And the actual verse says, and we know that all things work. All things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. The good reference in verse 28 further clarifies 29. But see, it's often missed, you know, in that part. And it says, for the good of those who love him is our transformation of being like Christ. And again, it's, you know, frequently misquoted because it, it, it reflects that egocentric view of, you know, the world we have in God's word and how, you know, if we're tempted beyond everything that we can do, he's still going to make a way. He's still going to work it out. Um, that is so false. Jeremiah 29 11, which is also one of my favorite scriptures, but it is always often misquoted because people want it to be about them. And what people will say, well, God has plans to prosper you. But that is not what it says. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And yes, when you first look at it, you know, it's just like, okay, I can see how it is. But the word translated prosper in this verse is the Hebrew word shalom, which is a theologically rich word for multiple facets, including completeness, safety, peace, welfare, and yes, prosperity. In the context of this passage, though, Israel was in exile because they rejected God. And, you know, and through, and though the outlook was gloomy, God had reassured his people that he would bring them back to Israel to fulfill his gracious promise to them. But it wasn't going to be for another 70 years. You know, in the meantime, they were instructed to settle down and seek peace and prosperity of the city to which they had been carried into exile, you know. Also, I have about one more. I'm going to go through. I'm, I got I got a couple of them. I have a couple of them. Um, another one, Philippians 4.13, where it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Basically, the verse has nothing to do with, you know, doing basketball, any types of sports, you know, you know, bench pressing, winning the lottery, closing a big deal. Basically, 
the Apostle Paul was under house arrest and awaiting trial where he was going to be possibly put to death for preaching the resurrection of Jesus. You know, however, instead of being defeated by unfortunate circumstances, Paul is using this opportunity to teach the young church in Philippi that he can endure any and every circumstances, ups and downs, highs and lows, because he has the strength that only comes from Jesus. And I could do a whole, whole series on just misquoted, you know, scriptures that we use to kind of suit our particular needs. You know, so we have to follow, you know, we want to follow our heart. But see, the thing is, we know our heart is not true. Yet we willingly forget God's states. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And that was in Jeremiah 17, 9. We talked about that last week. So to have a knowledge of God, our heart would be the last thing we would want to follow. Yet we still do over and over again. And sometimes it feels like we seem to never want to learn. You know, also the second warning is about the essence of deception. And it's the lie that we can play with fire and not get burnt. Now, I don't know whoever said that, but I know every time I touch fire, I got burned. And, you know, me and fire are not friends. Even when I cook, I try not to burn myself. But you definitely cannot play with fire and and not expect to get burnt. See, we can roll around in the mud with the farm animals and not get dirty. Or we can look like the world and think like the world and look like the world, you know, and value what the world values and craves what the world loves and acceptance and yet remain pure from the world. I'm going to say that again because I know when I was writing it, I was just like, that's just stupid for us to think that you can do that. And not be corrupted by the world. See, we think we can live like the world, think like the world, look like the world, value what the world values and craves the world's love and acceptance and yet remain pure from the world. That is paranoid thinking. See, God tells us that there's a one-way path when we associate with evil people. Just one way. And that way is from purity to to defilement. See, uh, from virtue to sin, from light to darkness, you know, if there's a one-way street that leads, it's the one-way street that leads from holiness to evil and things that is not of God. It is not the other way around. But see, I know Jesus is an amazing God and he changes our hearts. But we have to spend time with him. So don't be a seed, deceived, because then when you have people that don't have your best intentions, when you have people who have no intentions of doing what God has instructed them to do, their only mission and primary goal is to bring destruction you know we say things like but I love him but I love her and I know if we dated or get married you know he or she will eventually one day come to Jesus and become a Christian you know I know it lies you're being deceived you know another one which is good and I used to do this all the time. And this is why my grandmother told me, you know, you're going to be guilty by association. I would say they're my friends. I can hang with them and just not do what they're doing. You know, I can be a light in their darkness. You're being deceived. See, what we have to understand is that non-believers never become believers by osmosis. That takes a sovereign act of God. See, we've been warned by God not to be deceived into thinking good morals or good characters will redeem bad company. 
See, in fact, the truth is just the opposite. Don't be deceived into thinking this warning from God doesn't apply in your case for whatever reason you conjure up in your mind to justify your disobedience. It's just not going to happen. Why? Because God doesn't lie. He does not lie. It ain't going to happen. He's not. It's just not going to happen. Doesn't lie. And so when we come from that, when we think about the dangers of the bad company, we have to then deal with the addiction to peer pressure. See, thinking about the first chapter of Proverbs, see, and they laying out the scenario and you can read from some of the um, verses that I read. It's, you know, it's a classic peer pressure scenario. You know, if the us and the we and the they and the everyone against you and your and the faithfulness of God's word, it's a classic picture of temptations and of classic failure. Basically, it's like, oh, yes, I know that I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. But they're my friends and I don't really think they would do anything that was wrong and everything should work out and blah, blah, blah doesn't work like that see when we look in for proverbs um the first chapter um and at the eighth verse where i started earlier you you can see it is it's a warning from the the young man's parents to him and 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 it's a it's a gracious warning but it's a blessing in that warning you know so is basically, it's just like Proverbs 1, it says, My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains around your neck. So again, let's break down Proverbs 1 and 8 again. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law. So I'm going to read it with the definitions in it. This is exciting. My son, hear, listen, obey, proclaim to others the instruction, correction, discipline of your father and do not forsake, abandon, cast off or away to leave alone the law, direction, custom, manner of living of your mother. Why? For they, the instruction and discipline of your father and the law and custom or manner of living or example of your mother will be graceful ornaments on your head or a wreath of grace, a garland and chains about your neck. Imagine now you when you look at scripture and you begin to put the definitions of the key phrases in there, how it clears it up, how it makes it plain, how it really helps you to understand that it's for you. Of course, so many of us say, well, you know what? I don't understand. I don't read this particular scripture um, version or the translation. There are so many ways for you to get everything that you need, but it means staying in relationship and one-on-one with God. See, the phrase graceful ornament seems strange to us, you know, but what does exactly mean? Basically, is a garland and it's a reef, it's a decorative hairpiece worn as a sign of approval and honor, and it is given as a result of following wisdom. You know, and the chains about our neck might give us the mental picture of, you know, actual chain around your neck, like some of these rap artists used to do back in the day. Yes, I am so predating myself. But that's not what this passage is talking about. It's a necklace and it's used figuratively as wearing a parent's instruction around one's neck that is a value change of remembrance. Like in essence, 
It means don't forsake what you've been taught. Do not abandon the acceptance and honor you have received by living a life of wisdom. Do not throw it all away for the fleeting approval of the world. Do not become friends with those the Lord commands otherwise. Do not make yourself the very enemy of God. See, have you ever had situations or friendships or situationships that end very, very, very badly? And you don't know why they ended badly? Because what happened was that God told us to leave that person alone. God told us to walk away. God told us that we shouldn't have anything to do with this person, the place or the thing. And instead of obeying, Instead of doing what we're supposed to do, instead of being, you know, proactive and doing what God told us to do, we decided that it was going to be best to keep their company anyways. And so what does God do? He makes sure that that breakup is quick, swift and brutal. And he does that so that there can be no reconciliation. So it is so much easier. So much easier to do what he tells us to do when he tells us to do it. You know, I would rather, you know, maybe feel a little hurt by losing someone that God told me I have to walk away from than to be, didn't have God upset with me. Like, let's think about it. Who in their right minds wants to make themselves an enemy of God? But see, that's exactly what happens when we go after, pursue, and desire the friendship of the world. Again, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts bad habits. And as we think about the addiction of peer pressure, We think about how you can quickly, from that, quickly slide into sin and judgment. You know, I want you to pay careful attention to the detail in which the father warns his loved, naive, gullible young son about the ways of the world and the temptations he'll face. And we're going to discuss this in verse 10 of Proverbs 1. And it says, my son, if or when sinners or those reckoned as offenders, those facing condemnation for their action, those under the wrath and judgment of God entice or deceive, persuade, allure you what do not consent or yield, be willing or acquiescence. See, there's an appeal to the flesh that's almost irresistible it's just like intoxicating is powerful is greed it's anticipation companionship it's belonging all of what is found to be in christ is used as a temptation to entice you away from christ into the life of sin Because in Christ, there's acceptance. In Christ, there's power. In Christ, there's anticipation. In Christ, there's companionship. In Christ, there's belonging. So you don't need the world to give you what he can only give you and how he can give it to you. You know, have you ever been there? You know, have you ever been in a thought process to be like, you know, I know this isn't right, but I feel so wanted. I feel like I belong. See, do we do things just to satisfy our flesh and in our own ways? See, the very needs Christ promised to fulfill for us in his own flesh, we try to go outside of him. Remember, anything that you go outside of God to get, you have to stay out of him, outside of God in order to keep those things. So I'm going to tell you right now, I would rather, I would rather be inside the will of God than to be outside of his will. 
And let's talk about acceptance and belonging. You know, Proverbs 111, if or when they say come with us, that's acceptance and belonging. And then we're going to look at the power, violence, and excitement. And that's Proverbs, still Proverbs 11. It's the second part of um, the 11th verse going into the 12th verse. And it says, let us, that's acceptance and belonging, lie in wait, that's excitement, to shed blood, power, and violence. Let us, acceptance and belonging. Lurk secretly, excitement, for the innocent without cause, power and violence. Let us, acceptance and belonging, swallow them alive like Sheol, power, and whole like those who go down in the pit, power. Isn't that, just think of how everything coincides. Now we're going to go into the 13th verse. We acquiesces with acceptance and belonging shall find a kind of precious possessions as greed, lust, and the love of money. We acceptance and belonging shall fill our houses with the spoil Greed, lust, and love of money. We have to understand the warning from our father. See, now God tells us and shows us a lot of the times what we need to avoid. But in Proverbs 1, you know, the father reveals to his son as God reveals to you and me, the end result of a life lived in flesh. It's the natural consequence of being deceived by evil company. First, you were given a stern warning not to even get close to those under the wrath of God. Like don't even associate with them. Don't talk to them. Don't look at them. Don't walk with them. Stay away because see, they're not bound or yoked together by friendship or affection. You know, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawness and what communion has light with darkness. See, takes us to Proverbs one fifteen. It says, my son, do not walk in the way with them or in their manner or course of life on their journey. Keep your foot from their path. See, basically it's telling us to remain completely free from the contaminating influence of the world. It's just like, stay away from it. You know, cause see, we have to have our delight in the things of God, even his law and his decrees, you know, but see, here's the thing. Like, remember when we used to, as kids, We would just think that we were going to sneak out with our friends and do whatever. And we would, we didn't think that our parents actually knew about how our friends really operated and how they really, really got down and really worked. But see, but the, but God knows all about our friends, just like the father knew about his son's friends and basically what was going to actually happen to them. See, he also knows what was going to happen to his son if he continues down this path in the relationship with him. How, you know, how does he know this? Because he believes the word of God. See, and the warnings given as seen firsthand throughout his life, throughout our life, God gives us the warning. He tells us what not to do. Because if we don't listen Trust me, it will not end good. It won't. It won't end good at all. It will end very, very, very badly. So let's discuss how evil is always destructive. 
We um talking to Galatians 6, 7, and 8. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will the spirit reap everlasting life. So basically, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You know, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. See, there's only two roads, only two paths, only two choices. One is life and the other is destruction. So basically, which one is it going to be? Which road are you going to choose? Now, if we have any thoughts or questions or wonderings about that, he definitely tells us all the time what to choose. He tells us to choose life. He encourages us to choose life. He doesn't want us to choose anything else because he wants to always be reconciled with us. So... And just so that we just don't fall prey to deception we talked about in the beginning, the evil company corrupts good habits or morals, character thing. The father leaves us with a final global truth that applies to all mankind. That's quite simple. And basically what is in Proverbs 19, 1, 19, and it says, so are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain It takes away the life of its owners. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave that where it belongs. Because I don't want to lose my life over keeping evil company. See, one again, another favorite scripture that I love that gets misquoted all the time. Because, and people says, they would say that money is the root of all evil. And I said, no, that is being misquoted. That is not what it says. And it's actually 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 6 and 10. And it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which is while some coveted after they have erred from faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, so that's another commonly mis, you know, quoted scripture, you know, so just like people who are going after money and chasing money and just loving it, it consumes them. It's uncontrollable. It devours all that's in its path. And unfortunately, this very love for money is the hallmark centerpiece of our society. Basically, it's become our idol, our passion, and the standard in which we measure our own value or self-worth. You want to say, I make more money than this guy, therefore I'm better than this person. I can take a better vacation for than you, so I'm better than you. I have nicer clothes, a bigger house, a brand new car, therefore I'm better than you. But in those whose eyes are deemed better than man, yours, probably, but you know, nothing, no one's better than God. Nothing is better than God. So let's think about how much is enough? How much is enough? You know, basically, maybe one says just a little bit more, or I really don't know. For some reason, the millions of dollars I already have don't make me feel good about myself. So I guess I'll get a a little bit more. It'll help. But see, true joy comes from the fear of God. After all. The very fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that wonderful knowledge is blessed and holy. And so when we think about our study in the Proverbs so far, we have seen that the wisdom requires 
fearing the Lord so that we heed his word, respecting our parents so that we listen to their advice, you know, and exactly what about our friends? You know, our peers we spend so much time with, might they not be the source of good counsel and good wisdom? You know, do not consent to their counsel, like listening to our father's advice, especially when they seek to entice you to do evil or when they tempt you with the promises of easy gain. Stay away. They're not your friends. Basically, don't walk with them. Again, this is our Proverbs 1. Don't walk with them. Keep away from people who are quick to do evil. You know, their er efforts are ultimately in vain and they'll eventually pay with their own lives. You know, basically such is the way of greed. It destroys those who possesses it. You know. The reason why you definitely, again, want to stay away from evil companions or bad company is they use enticement to persuade you to do things that you should not do. Like the serpent tempted Eve, sinful friends will appeal to the lust of the flesh, good for food. The lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes, and the pride of life, desirable to make one wise. These types of people will offer easy gains such as wealth without work, you know, such as pleasure without commitment, such as companionship without cause. It sounds easy and it sounds too good to be true, but it is. And see, those who are not good to be in your company, they ignore the cost of sin. See, they ignore the cost of sin because they don't really have the, you know, sin building up on them. They don't think about it. You know, sin destroys those who, pos- you know, who possess in it. So so-called friends will eventually turn on one another. And if they will sin with you, how do you know they won't sin against you? You know, that sin will eventually expose those who continue in it. Be sure your sin will find you out. Sin requires lies and deceptions and eventually someone's going to get caught in the web of lies. And sin often carries a physical price that cannot be hidden, whether it's addiction, disease, things you cannot get away from them. Don't listen to the ones who ain't got your best intention at heart. See, what they promise, they really can't deliver, at least for long. And a truly blessed man does not walk in their counsel. Be wise enough not to heed their enticing words. Not only don't listen to them, stay away from them. You know, it's not to say that we can't try to save them. But we must separate from the world. We cannot isolate ourselves, but we cannot be of the world. Even Jesus was a friend to sinners. But see, we must be honest with ourselves. Do we influence them more than do, you know, we influence them more than they do us? If not, then we should stay away until we're strong enough to be a positive influence. You know, to be wise, We must know to listen to God, parents, and good friends, and who not to listen to anyone who is out there doing craziness and doing the things that they want to do. So how can we choose the people that is going to be good fits for us and good companions for us? One, I want you to choose your friends carefully. You know, many of God's people have lost their calls in him because they chose to hang out with the wrong type of people. You know, 
we, you know, end up sometimes choosing the wrong type of people to become friends with, and then they can end up leading us astray from God and with what he wants us to do in our lives. Number two, the benefits of choosing, you know, good friends. See, once you turn the reins over of your life over to God for him to fully handle, he now will make sure that you get matched up with the right kind of people you can become true God friends with. And if you don't believe that, understand this, iron sharpens iron. See, a true good friend not good. I'm going to take out the word good. A good God friend, a true God friend will always be honest and straightforward with you. And you cannot keep help keep each other up and sharpen, you know, and stay sharp in the word unless you're willing to be totally honest with one another. So those are the types of people that you want to have around you. Um, also do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. See, many of us as believers have had our lives totally ruined and destroyed as a result of marrying the wrong people or choosing the wrong kinds of friends to hang out with. Because they're never going to understand what you're going through. They're never going to understand why you got to do certain things. They think it's ridiculous. They think it's redundant. They don't understand because they have not given the commitment. They have not decided to make the walk. So they don't understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you're about. So you can't be unequally yoked. And again, if you have turned your life over to God and you have allowed him to make the plans and make the moves and make the decisions, this wouldn't be an issue because he is going to direct and guide you to where you need to be and how you need to be. See, once you enter into this real supernatural walk with God, we're going to need good God-centered friends to share, to talk about our ups and downs, to tell about our joys. We're not going to be able to contain it if it is just us because it's going to be simply too many good God things that will happen in our lives that we are just going to want to share it with one another. See, I believe Jesus you know, was giving us a major piece of revelation when he started sending the apostles out two by two instead of by themselves. For those who have them not been matched up with a good God friend at this time, go to God in prayer and ask him to bring you the right person that would be best suited for you at your present level of spiritual development in him. Now, unless God is keeping you all to himself for a reason and a season, there is no reason that God will not want you to move on his, you know, God will not want to move on his request to bring you a true special God friend in order to help accelerate your spiritual growth. But again, turn it over to him. Allow God to be God. Allow him to do what he needs to do. And again, 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. We have to remember that we must be wise to know who to listen to and not and who not to listen to. When it comes to the company that we keep. I want to thank you for listening this evening to the Moving Past You radio show. Be sure to visit us on our Facebook page. Um, You can go on Facebook and you can search Moving Past You. Come on and join the conversation. Get bonus bonus show notes and just awesome content as to what we have going on for the next, you know, few months. You are coming into the holiday season. Um, You can also subscribe on the show um, on iTunes or Spotify. Just search for Moving Past You. 
And also join us next week as we close out our four week series character under construction. And next week we are going to be talking about the fruits of the spirit. So again, always remember to be kind in your word, thought, and deed. Be blessed. I love you so very much. Have a wonderful evening and I will see you or speak with you on next week at the same time. Be blessed. Love you and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Talk to you next week. Goodbye.